Well, thank you for the introduction, Kelsey. And uh, I, just before I begin the presentation and begin sharing my screen, I just want to uh, begin by uh, acknowledging that uh, I am currently situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Seal Okanagan Nation uh, here in the beautiful uh, Okanagan Valley. And uh, it's a real privilege um, I, for, for me over the last few years to uh, be a guest in this space. Uh, my work is uh, preoccupied by landscape, and it's been uh, always important for me to recognize the traditions and the customs uh, of the land on which I work. And um, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to say that. And I'd also like to just also uh, mention that um, something that's on all of our collective imaginations right now is the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, while I'll go through about four or five different projects, uh, two of which are particularly prescient in uh, the current pandemic age, uh, the project that I'll begin with virtually there and my project on the Canada U S border. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen and just get into looking at some images. So everybody should be able to see my PowerPoint now, yes? Okay, I see some nods, good, good. Uh, okay, so the first project that I'll be talking about is called Virtually There. Uh, it began on, during residencies, back-to-back uh, -back residencies at the Gushel Studio, which is in the Crow's Nest Pass area of the Southeast Rockies, uh, and at the BAMP Center. And uh, leading up to the, the production of this work, um, I was uh, making images online using the, at the time, recent Google Earth technology. So uh, what I find interesting in terms of our pandemic scenario is that many people have been relying on these technologies now to take virtual trips since we cannot travel uh, in actuality. Um, but I was doing this uh, because the technology was, was new and I was looking at the process of repeat photography. So I'll show a few examples of, of that process. and. Uh, just a quick mention of, uh, in terms of this image, this is at the Campbell River Art Gallery uh, on Vancouver Island, uh, an exhibition of the work that took place in 2014. Um, so uh, here's a photo of me. This will be familiar to my family members. Uh, <laughs> I looked when I was 17 years old. Uh, this is my trekking permit from the Annapurna Trail, which is, um, a high altitude trek in the Himalaya in Nepal. It circumambulates the world's 10th highest mountain, Annapurna 1. Uh, we didn't go around the whole base. We, we trekked for a number of days. Uh, but this was a really formative experience for me in terms of uh, my interest in the mountains. Growing up in the prairies, uh, we didn't have access to a lot of topographic terrain, uh, but this trip was, was really life-changing in a number of ways. And uh, I saved up uh, the money that my parents had, had given me, the, the spending money, and I spent most of it on uh, what you see here, which is a uh, topographic map produced by a German agency. It's a beautiful uh, lithographed map of the Annapurna circuit. And so uh, what was interesting at that time to me is this, this concept that I had a camera, I had a 35 millimeter point and shoot film camera uh, because this was again 1997, it was pre-digital. Uh, but um, I, I was taking many photographs, but I knew that the photography, that photography was incapable of representing uh, the entire magnitude of my experience there. So with the map, uh, already in my 17-year-old brain, I had this concept that I could bring the map home and I could show my family and my friends I was here. And so on the one hand, um, and this map is, is highly detailed, it's an extremely uh, detailed map. Um, on the one hand, maps uh, are very objective. But on the other hand, maps lie. They're an interpretation of the terrain, right? The map is not the territory. You may have heard this, this phrase. Um, and so I find maps and photography uh, very much in parallel in terms of the uh, expression of veracity or the way that these things can act as um, 
evidence of something, right? Uh, so photography similarly can lie. And my photographs, the photographs that I'll show you tonight are, are often constructs. Um, so uh, whether that, that be digital manipulation in order uh, to remove certain elements or to uh, heighten certain aspects of the photograph, or whether that be just the, the fact that I am choosing a particular vantage a particular point in time uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, showing the world through a particular framing device. Um, so here's an example of how ma maps can be very fantastical. So this is a map from uh, the late 16th, uh, early 17th century by Gerardus Mercator. It's a, um, a map of the North Pole. Uh, and Mercator imagined the North Pole having dual magnetic poles. And as you know, in terms of uh, the historical uh, timeline of exploration. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is an imaginary map. It's an, a map of an imaginary terrain. Um, this project was also informed uh, not only by my interest in cartography, but it was also informed by the work of one family of photographers that came from Philadelphia, and you see them here. Uh, this is the Vox family. So the Vox family were scientists. They were um, arguably North America's first glaciologists, and they were also avid photographers. Uh, as you see, William Vox Jr. on the left-hand side of the frame is using uh, a wet plate collodion camera, and this is very much similar to the equipment that I used for my own project. I shoot on film still most of my work, four by five inch sheet film, uh, and then my negatives are scanned and printed digitally predominantly. Um, so they're, they're using the same technology. And so that was kind of critical that I was using the same tool essentially that this family used. And they were among the first explorers, or I should say a settler colonial Western explorers of uh, the Rocky Mountains, Selkirk Mountains, and um, the, you know, the, 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 the high altitude regions of the West. And um, they hired guides. You see two guides uh, kind of second in from the left and then far right. Right. Um, so they hired uh, Swiss and Austrian guides to help blaze trails and establish routes in the mountains. And in terms of the element of repeat photography, I find this aspect critical because if you go hiking in the Rockies in Banff National Park, for example, or as we see here in Rogers Pass in what's now Glacier National Park in, in um, British Columbia, uh, the trails that you hike today are the same trails that were that were cut and established by the Vox family and their guides. And they would re return to the same vantage points year after year in order to track the recession of the glaciers. So uh, we see here, maybe some of you have been to this particular vantage. It's on Avalanche Mountain uh, in Rogers Pass. And we're looking at the Illisilouit Glacier, which um, now, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but now kind of occupies uh, this, the snout of the glacier occupies this area up here. I don't know if you can see that. Kelsey, can you see my cursor? Oh, okay, good. Uh, so that works as a little uh, laser pointer, virtual laser pointer. Uh, so the Vox family, they were, they were very um, skilled at making images in a romantic tradition. You'll see down here a figure uh, clutching his knee and regarding the landscape. This is very much in keeping with German romanticism and concepts of spirituality, the insignificance of humanity juxtaposed to the grandeur of nature, right? So um, they, were, they were scientists and they were making these pictures for scientific endeavor, but they were also making these images with... Um, a very rich vocabulary in terms of the history of art making. Um, and this is an image that they made, uh, and, and this is where I begin to get into my work, uh, pardon the preamble, but uh, this is an image that they made in 1902 from Abbott Pass, which is along the Continental Divide between Alberta and British Columbia. It separates the watersheds, and uh, in this case, it separates Lake Louise. Uh, maybe some of you have stood at the, the, the lake and had tea or been so fortunate as to spend the night at the chateau, but um, when you're looking down the lake, you're looking at Mount Victoria, and uh, this is essentially that, that reverse view. Um, and so looking at these pictures, I was inspired to make my own images. So here's a photograph that I made from Abbott Pass in 2008 uh, with my film camera. 
this was not uh, leading up to the project virtually there, but uh, I was considering that aspect of repeat photography. And then when I returned to my Montreal apartment, because I lived in Montreal for 12 years and during the entire production period of this project, I started using Google Earth and making screenshots of the companion views. So uh, my image looks like this, and this is now the Google equivalent. Um, and this is what planted the seed for my project. So I thought, well, rather than making my own images first, what if I make virtual or take virtual excursions and then uh, reenact those excursions with my own camera? Uh, so that's what I did. Um, so the images, they're not in any particular order in terms of uh, chronology. Um, and I can give a little bit of backstory because I think that's what the purpose of an artist talk is. Uh, you know, you can you could easily go to my website and see these images. But uh, the first thing that I'll tell you is the title for these works are the longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates for the locations. Uh, the location in the case of this image is where the picture was actually made, where the shutter was tripped on my camera and for the companion views you, you may notice uh, all of the titles are identical uh, that's the latitude and longitude of my Montreal apartment where the images were, were made um, and there there are certain elements um, that differ quite radically. I think this is a good example. Um, it's always sunny in Google Earth, for instance. Uh, the, there, there, there's, there's no a sense of atmosphere or weather. Um, and there are slippages between the two-dimensional terrestrial image that's, that's generated, right, from a, a, a remote sensing satellite and the kind of the, the topographic mesh that the mountains are built up out of. Uh, whereas the photograph, you could argue, is maybe more factual in that sense in terms of its depiction of the actual terrain. Um, and then there's also that added sense of atmosphere and uh, weather conditions. Uh, and then obviously there are some inaccuracies with uh, Google's rendition of the landscape. So on the left hand side, you have my photograph made with a large format camera. Um, and I'll have some examples coming up, some details, but uh, the amount of description that this camera provides is, is quite phenomenal. And that's why I choose this tool as I make very large prints and I like that the audience can get very close to the print and see a great amount of detail. Um, so, you know, you can see small figures in some of my works that are not apparent on the screen right now. Um, so I have some examples of, of that process later on. But uh, in this case, on the left, you see the Grand Sentinel and you see this kind of very uh, intricate ridge line, whereas Google has sheared that all off because of the, the amount of or lack of description. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is a particularly pleasing set of mountains. It's called the, Saw, the Sawback Range. It's right outside of Banff, uh, the town of Banff. Uh, it's a really particularly beautiful spot. And this is from the top of Mount Bourgeau, this picture. Um, and I guess something curious about this one, uh, in terms of the title, you'll see uh, in parentheses, imagery date, and then two sets of dates. So uh, the majority of this image was generated via the Landsat satellite, which is one of the early uh, remote sensing satellites that's been going around the, the world now. Um, and then in the kind of um, right-hand corner, you see a segment that's in much greater uh, detail. And that was made with GOI, which is a more recent uh, higher resolution uh, satellite. So this, this image in and of itself kind of speaks to the process of how uh, Google images are generated. And um, that is to say, you know, none, none of these images are actually owned by Google. Google does not own remote sensing satellites. These are all kind of subcontracted. A question that I get a lot is like, have I ever been threatened with a cease and desist or threatened with a lawsuit because of this project? And the answer is no, because Google actually doesn't uh, own the copyright or doesn't manage the creative the content themselves. Uh, they're just uh, providing a service uh, to, to the public. It's branding for them. Uh, here are some of the satellites. So you have uh, Landsat, which I mentioned earlier, started um, circum circumnavigating the globe in 1972, and the Landsat satellites are still up there. And uh, that kind of comes back into my, my current research about wildfire uh, in uh, Western Canada. And uh, actually, you know, you might ask, why is Landsat still 
useful as a tool, even though the resolution is not as good. And that's because there's this, this great archive of imagery. So you can track change over time in a way that you can't with, let's say, GOI, which just started going around the world in 2008. So there's a, a much greater repository, even though the resolution isn't as, as good. Um, so I mentioned that my, my work is often large. Uh, so here's a, an installation view. It's actually myself. I, I often don't have friends on hand when I shoot these things. So uh, it's a self-portrait, if you like, of me standing in front of my work um, at the Maison de la Culture Frontenac. It was part of uh, what used to be called Le Mois de la Photo. It's now called Momenta uh, Biennial of Photography in Montreal. Um, and yeah, what, what this installation view kind of reveals is that whenever possible, I do not show the work as diptychs like you've been seeing in the slideshow. I try to situate them around corners or adjacent to one another across gallery, the gallery space because I feel strongly that both the virtual view and the view made with my four by five camera have something different to offer the spectator. So I like them to kind of, it's almost like seeing a friend that you, that you recognize, you're like, oh, like I saw this image before, uh, but in a slightly different configuration. Um, and then uh, what I think is still kind of like one of my crowning achievements with this project uh, involved this, this curtain wall at, at the um, Maison de la Couture Frontenac. Uh, so this was like the foyer space of the gallery that you saw in the previous slide. And so they had these windows and they wanted me to do a project there. So uh, the image that you see here, uh, the six panels, this was printed on UV backlit film. So it's like a giant light box. And it was only visible from the interior of the gallery because it needed to be lit from behind. And then uh, the six panels that you see here, uh, it was, this is the companion view on the outside of the gallery space. And it was printed on perforated vinyl uh, like you would see on a bus um, so you know when, when you see advertisements on a bus uh, it's an opaque sign from the outside but when you're on the bus you can actually see out the window uh, so that, that was the concept is that um, from the outside you could only see one of the two images from the inside you could see the reverse image but not the one from the outside and so that kind of wraps up that project. I mean, I kind of mentioned in the preamble that uh, I've been thinking a lot about those images because, well, I'm like the rest of you trapped inside for the most part. Uh, I can travel really remote or really locally, but not uh, go on any extended trips. Um, and, and also this concept of how technology, like Zoom is bringing me into, you know, my family and friends living rooms right now, which is fantastic. Um, but also how, how those technologies can be used to kind of vicariously experience the land. And, and that's also not a new concept, you know, as, as a photographer, I'm, I'm fundamentally fascinated by, uh, how, you know, what we're dealing with now, these are traditions that were established in the 19th century at the onset of the medium, right? Uh, travel photography was, was used, you know, people like Francis Frith would take pictures of, you know, the Temple of Karnak or um, the pyramids in Egypt and then make photo books and, and people who could not afford to or didn't have the resources to travel to those places could do so through photography. Um, the second project that I'll talk about and again, a reminder, if you do have questions, feel free to flag Kelsey down through the chat. Um, second project, it, it was very different in terms of its uh, genesis. It began as an artist residency in a place called Sarnia, Ontario. And uh, full disclosure, I, I don't know, I, I'm not looking through like the participant list right now, but if anybody from the gallery in Sarnia is watching, uh, you know, maybe you know this already, maybe you don't. But um, I didn't really know anything about Sarnia when I got the opportunity to do this residency. I knew uh, what we see here. I knew the back of the former Canadian $10 bill with the Chemical Valley. So I knew it was Canada's major production center for petrochemicals. Um, and I proposed a project that involved uh, GPSs that would keep members of the community engaged while uh, they closed their doors for a year and transitioned into a new space. They have a beautiful uh, new gallery as of 2013, I believe, maybe late 2012. Uh, and it's called the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery. And so if you're ever in the region, go check it out. 
Um, so the gallery purchased a dozen of these GPS units and uh, they could borrow them. They could take them out on a walk, a bike, a drive around Lambton County, which is the county in which Sarnia is situated. And the project began as a collaboration between myself and Lee Rodney, who's an artist, an academic, a writer from the University of Windsor. And uh, it was called Lambton Between the Lines initially. And so we developed this form that uh, participants could fill out and they could mark down uh, you know, the dates of their travel, they could attach photographs and they uh, were provided with space to construct a narrative. Uh, and it says specifically, tell us about the site that you visited, where did you go? What is significant about this place to you? And again, full disclosure, most people like walk their dogs around the block and it was super boring. Uh, but this one individual whose uh, form we see here uh, took me to a place called Oil Springs, which is the birthplace of uh, the North American oil industry. Uh, we also uh, developed a blog, it was called Sensing Place, Lambton Between the Lines. We conducted um, interviews with members of the community uh, regarding what, what their experience growing up and living in Sarnia Lambton was like. Uh, we culled Im images from the archive in a town called Wyoming and posted kind of then and now pictures from the 19th and early 20th century and today. Uh, and that fed into a series of community bike tours that we ran with this organization, uh, the Sarnia Artist Run Collective for Art, Science, and Music. Uh, their acronym is SARCASM, which is pretty great. Um, so we did a series of bike tours uh, with SARCASM where we produced these little like cheap brochure type things with uh, then and now photographs. And we would go to those sites and, and uh, have a bit of dialogue in terms of like, hey, what did this place look like in 1912? And what happened here historically? Um, and Sarnia is beautiful in the summer. We were all riding around on bikes and we had like a battery operated radio and had tunes and it was great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, you know, what, what really captivated me is uh, the history of this place. And uh, in the archive, we found images, including this one, uh, with three-pole derricks and pump jacks uh, littered throughout the environment. And when you go there today, you see this kind of beautiful uh, black ash swamp. It's a, it's a beautiful kind of pastoral landscape. And you don't really consider the history of uh, how you know, despoiled it was, how industrialized that landscape was. And so I started thinking of like images by Edward Bertinsky, his oil series, and uh, thinking about, you know, modern oil fields in the US, in, um, you know, uh, Azerbaijan and places like this. Um, but my photographs were looking at kind of the reverse side of this, uh, because at that time that I started photographing there, and the, the pictures were made between 2011 and 2013. And uh, I was looking at the decommissioning of the industrial sector because a number of businesses, including uh, Dow, which you see here, uh, and again, these pictures are better big when you can see all the details, but um, Dow was once the largest employer in the Chemical Valley. And at the time of uh, my creation of this picture, I think there were only eight or 10 employees working from home offices within the Sarnia area. So vegetation started to re, purpose the landscape and 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 you know nature as we're learning through COVID-19 can be quick to regenerate in certain cases um, and and then simultaneously I was going to these ancient oil fields so uh, this is the town of Oil Springs where oil was first discovered in Canada and arguably in North America again to make a photographic comparison it's like Louis Jacquemin de Daguerre, the Frenchman who developed the daguerreotype, and William Henry Fox Talbot, the Englishman who developed the calotype or Talbotype. They were two fundamentally different processes, but they achieved the same result, photography. And here um, in Canada, we dug for oil, whereas uh, at the Drake Well in Western Pennsylvania, which I also visited as part of the research process, uh, they drilled for oil. And that's now the ubiquitous technology, just like Talbot's reproducible negative style format right um is the ubiquitous technology for photography today uh, 
so this is Oil Springs uh, today, and uh, what we're looking at here is the farm of Charlie Fairbank. So he's a fifth generation oil farmer, um, and uh, there are a number of oil farmers in the area that continue to use the same process of extraction uh, from the 19th century uh, to draw crude oil from the wells today. It's called the Jerker Line process and you see a pump jack here and a pump house on the right um, that, that are part of that, uh, that industrial apparatus. And this is all functional equipment. Um, the one shortcoming of my presentation is I can't very effectively show video with audio. But if you go on my website, there's a video called Oil with an exclamation point. It takes its title from the Upton Sinclair novel that some of you might be familiar with, or it's a filmic uh, reinterpretation in the form of the Daniel Day-Lewis film, There Will Be Blood, a uh, fantastic picture as well. Um, but this is the interior of one of the uh, pump houses, and you see a small electric motor that I'm circling here with my mouse. Um, originally, these would have been steam powered. And then through a series of belts, pulleys, step up wheels, that mechanical energy is transferred into uh, parallel ash timbers that walk back and forth out of both sides of the pump house. And then they power the pump jacks. Um, so you see a pump jack here. And uh, again, just kind of going back and forth between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. So uh, whereas uh, a typical oil farmer in Lambton County will produce somewhere in the uh, area of a thousand barrels of oil in a week, uh, Imperial Oil and Shell refine a, around a half million barrels of oil daily. Um, whether they're doing that today is a <laughs> another question, but um, you know, in a typical day, uh, what we're looking at here is the Dow Chemical Wetlands, um, and these wetlands, you know, it's a it's a corporate responsibility initiative. On the one hand, it gives people, like local residents, a place to walk their dogs and to recreate and observe the landscape, but they're also used as um, a bio biological uh, testing ground, right? So they're testing uh, species of plants that can recuperate hydrocarbons more effectively and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I began with a territorial acknowledgement and a number of the pictures that I've made over the years have been uh, in or around uh, contested indigenous sovereign territories. And what we're looking at here is the Amjanong First Nation. Uh, and it's the Sarnia Chippewas uh, Cemetery. Uh, so it's hemmed in on all sides by refineries, even though this is a um, multi-millennial old sacred site and sacred burial ground. Um, so the Amjanong would have uh, had possession and I looked through records at the uh, Wyoming archive and it's quite dubious in terms of how everything was was handed over to um, in the industrial corporations. But um, there are a couple of films that I can turn your attention to. One's called Toxic Trespass and the other's called The Disappearing Male. And these documentaries look at uh, some of the plight that uh, the Amjanong nation has gone through. Basically, they're not giving birth to male children anymore because of the um, pollutants, right? Um, and, then, and then these are just screenshots from my video called Oil. Um, so in a nutshell, um, you can watch a clip on my website, but in a nutshell, um, it begins as this kind of abstract apparatus uh, uh, in the forest, and then it's gradually revealed to be uh, you know, a machine for extracting oil. And it's, it's quite stunning. It, it, you know, if you, if you are in the area or maybe some of you have seen this already, it's, it's an amazing sight. And uh, the sound is incredible and the smell also of sweet crude. Um, it's a holistic substance, right? And um, indigenous people uh, since 2,500 years ago were using uh, crude oil as a treatment for rheumatism and arthritis and even ingesting uh, crude oil as a uh, treatment for various ailments. Um, and yeah, when you're, when you're there and it, it doesn't smell like the oil that you put in your car, it's not um, heavily processed. Um, so then the next project is kind of two projects in one. It began in 2010 with an invitation from a curator artist friend of mine named Geneviève Chevalier. And um, she wanted me to be part of this uh, three-person group exhibition with two artists who are really like 
crazy, unbelievable. It was a pretty amazing experience for me. Uh, Ursula Beeman and Christian Philip Mueller, um, especially Ursula Beeman. I really, well, I shouldn't say especially. I mean, both of them, I, I respect their work tremendously. So uh, the opportunity was was immense. Um, but the project, it was called Projet Stansted ou Comment Traverser la Frontière, which means uh, Stansted Project or How to Cross the Border. And so Geneviève came to me with this idea of, um, making work about Stansted, Quebec, Derby Line, Vermont, which is one of the most bizarre uh, idiosyncratic sites along the Canada-US border. And so 2010, we're talking like two years after the implementation of the Department of Homeland Security, still a number of policies in the United States following September 11th, 2001, were being rolled out, including the closure of um, a number of the streets that formerly connected uh, these two communities, right? One being in the province of Quebec and the other in the state of Vermont. Um, so I went to the town, I met with Geneviève, we had some, some meals there together and, um, and talked about, you know, what was going on. Um, just behind me in this shot is the Haskell Free Library and Opera House, which is a very strange construction. It's um, the United States' only library without books and Canada's only opera house without a stage, I believe the saying goes, because you enter, the, the front door is in Vermont, and then you cross back over into Quebec. So uh, to access the library, you enter into Vermont from Vermont, and then you come back into Quebec where the collection is housed, and the opposite is true of uh, the opera house. So if you are witnessing a performance, uh, you're seated in Canada, but the stage is actually in the United States. Uh, and this was built deliberately right on the Canada-US border as a sign of good faith um, from the Haskell family, who's, uh, I can't remember which way it goes. I think the matriarch was from the United States and the patriarch was uh, Canadian, but I, I, could get, I could be getting that wrong. But yeah, one of them was American, one of them's Canadian. And one, it was a symbol of friendship between these two nations. And today it's really problematic, right? Because this poses a security threat. And a number of the buildings in Stansted that uh, the border transgresses have uh, run into disrepair because it's very difficult to upkeep and maintain or certainly to develop further uh, any architecture along the border. But I was at the time more interested in this kind of wilderness border zone. Uh, so I, I was particularly fascinated by the cut line. Uh, again, going back to this concept of a map, when we look at a map and we see a border, we think of it as a line. We think of it as something that's very finite and something that um, is very immediate, right? But borders have thickness and uh, the thickness of the Canada-US border is uh, six meters. So uh, from, you know, and this is surveyed the entire length, 9,961 kilometers. It's the world's longest undefended land boundary um, for the time being. And, um, and it's surveyed and it's monitored in certain places and not in others, but, um, but that border is actually six meters wide. So what I decided to focus on is this no man's land, right? These pictures are essentially made in neutral territory, which is maintained by an organization called the International Boundary Commission. So some of the photographs are looking east and some are looking west. So that, that means that Quebec is on different sides, depending on which image you're looking at. And uh, these were made with my, my large format camera, but they were actually um, silver gelatin or gelatin silver prints, uh, selenium toned. And then my friend Martin Schopp in Montreal did a great job of framing them with museum glass. So the idea was to create this kind of um, the epitome of a permanent object, right? These prints are going to outlast me by hundreds of years as long as they're cared for in a decent manner. Um, and so I, I like that, that, that concept of kind of juxtaposing something that's so permanent with uh, this borderline, which would regrow in a number of years if left unmanaged. Um, and then while creating this project, and there, there's video components, and I made like a series of artist books and stuff related to the project, but um, I'll kind of keep moving on. Um, but while working on that project, I thought, what if I photographed the entire Canada-US border? Has this been done before? And uh, my research quickly brought me to a book called Between Friends, which I've uh, conducted along with my good friend Carla McManus, uh, a great deal of uh, research regarding, um, 
I guess, December of 2018, we did a month-long fellowship with the National Gallery and uh, looked into the um, collection of the National Film Board of Canada's stills division uh, regarding that project. But uh, at the time, I thought, you know, it hasn't been done since 1976, so I need to photograph the whole Canada-US border. So in 2012, with the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, I'd like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, as well as the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec, as well as the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, as well as UBC. Hey, I didn't actually thank UBC, because this is part of the UBC Okanagan Lecture Series. Um, but anyhow, um, it took me three years to do this project. So uh, here are some of the locations. That, uh, that I prioritized. I broke it up into different stages, uh, photographing primarily in between spring and autumn um, because I teach. I teach a full load. It's difficult for me to get away in the middle of the semester. Um, way up here in 2014, along with my then partner, Jessica Auer, I did a uh, artist residency for two weeks along the Chilkoot Trail, so photographed um, the border between uh, Yukon and British Columbia and Alaska at that time. Um, and yeah, so went from coast to coast and wrapped up shooting in May. Uh, hey, this is going to be the fifth year anniversary of the wrapping of the shooting, so May of 2015 uh, I finished the project. And so I'll get into some of the images, but I would like to, I guess, preface them by saying that uh, as soon as I completed the photography piece on this project, it became an archive. And today it's, it's further removed as an archive because this border remains closed. Uh, what we're actually looking at here in light of COVID is the safest place in the United States. It's Point Roberts, which is one of two uh, exclaves. So the only way of accessing Point Roberts is uh, to drive through Canada. So this is uh, adjoined to Tuasin, British Columbia. So it's in the Delta region, maybe an hour and a half outside of Vancouver. Um, phenomenally beautiful area. Um, but yeah, the project initially became an archive because of the election of President Trump. And a number of the sites um, that I photographed would be made much more difficult to photograph now and would be impossible in certain cases. For example, um, I know my father is listening. Uh, him and I uh, went down to Emerson in 2014 and photographed the, uh, the decommissioned border crossing uh, at, at that point. And I think we saw like one US Border Patrol officer maybe like kind of looking at us and giving us a wave. Um, but post-Trump, that became a pinch point for human flow and uh, illegal migration due to the Safe Third Country Agreement. So uh, a number of these pictures, you know, you, you couldn't really make today. Um, this is the easternmost point. So I actually kind of bookended it. This is the westernmost point along the Canada-US border. Um, these things that we're looking at here, the obelisk that says international boundary. I don't know if you can read that, but those are called obelisks. They're markers that, uh, that delineate the center of that six meter wide uh, boundary. So you can't build anything within three meters of either side of the obelisk. And wherever there's forest, the forest is cleared on, on either side of that obelisk or that survey mark uh, to three meters. Uh, and then this is the easternmost point on the Canada-US border. This is uh, Campobello Island. Um, and uh, forgive me to anybody from New Brunswick who happens to be listening, if that's the case, but uh, I didn't think much of the landscape of New Brunswick until I worked on this project. And it is, it's just freaking gorgeous, especially Campobello Island. It's a beautiful place. Um, so we're looking at the, the Mulholland Point Lighthouse and a number of pictures in that uh, book between friends. It was, it was funny because when I went into the archive in 2018, all these images that hadn't made it to press started coming to light. And there's an almost identical picture of this lighthouse uh, made in 1974 um, in, in the archive. Um, this is uh, one of the most northerly shots in the series. This is along the Chilkoot Trail. And so each one of those monuments or obelisks has a number. This is number 120. They're made of different material. So um, in the Yukon, they're predominantly made of bronze and they're lift, airlifted in by helicopter. Sometimes they're made of granite. Sometimes they're made of concrete or steel. Um, this is Monument 162B. This is outside of 
uh, Beaver Creek, uh, which is the border between Yukon and Alaska. And you, you might be able to make out on the bench in the foreground, it says Alaska on one side, and then there's like a bar and then Yukon on the other side. So uh, yeah, I was, I was interested in, I guess, the, the quirky aspect. Um, I was interested in the idiosyncratic sites. And um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that, that photography can lie. And so the lie that I'm telling with this series is I'm presenting the border as uh, much more porous than it is in actuality. So an example, actually this image is a great example of that. So uh, this is in uh, just outside of Waterton Lakes National Park. It's the chief mountain port of entry, which is a seasonal port of entry. Uh, you can only access it between, I think it's like, end of May and the beginning of September. And um, in order for me to make this photograph, uh, I parked my car on the Canadian side of the border. I checked in with Canadian Customs at their port of entry to tell them what I was doing because if they see somebody with a camera or just somebody get out of their car and try walking across the border, they're gonna stop you. And then um, my directive from them was always, you need to go to the American port of entry and speak to the American officials and get their clearance before coming back to the cut line between uh, that, that surveyed mark and making your photograph. So uh, I would then go and wait in line and talk to the Americans at the port of entry, right? The um, US Customs and Border Protection. And then I would come back and set up my camera and make my picture. And then after I made my picture, because I was now entering Canada, after technically having entered the United States, I would have to re repeat the experience of reporting to uh, Canadian Customs and CBSA at the port of entry. So to make an image like this, um, notwithstanding the fact that the large format camera is slow and cumbersome to begin with, it took probably half an hour to 45 minutes just in terms of the logistics. And even when I was out in the field, like we see here at Whiskey Gap, Alberta, oh, actually here I didn't happen to see anybody, but even in locations such as this, I was often confronted by either RCMP or US Border Patrol, who are the field ops agents in uh, these two, two nations. Um, and so, but what I was interested in, in terms of content, is this picture, I mean, it just looks like any other cattle fence, um, but only when you see my full size image and you read the text on these small orange markers, do you realize that this is actually an international boundary? So I'm presenting the border again as more porous and more bucolic uh, than, than it actually is. Um, there's a crazy story that goes along with this picture about Matthew Coolidge and the Center for Land Use Interpretation, but I won't, I won't tell that today. I gotta leave some, something for the questions. Um, so if, you, if, if you're dying to know, you can ask me about what happened with the CLUI at Beaver Creek, or Big Beaver, Saskatchewan. Um, you know, and, and again, like a, a number of these crossing stations, their time is limited. Uh, I remember talking to the officers, the um, CBSA officers at this port of entry, Snowflake, and I was the only person that they did not know personally who had crossed the border that day. They said the traffic is usually around 20 to 40 people in a single day. Um, and a few of the uh, CBSA officers told me, and this was really an interesting confession, that they were going to retire early because this was at the time that uh, CBSA officers were being mandated to uh, carry weapons. And they said they didn't want to be uh, armed, so they were just going to retire. Um, this no longer exists. Speaking of archives, these are the, uh, the, the peace towers in the International Peace Garden. They came down in early 2015, I believe, like March 2015. I actually have video somewhere from the construction company that was contracted. They posted it on their Facebook page of them tearing them down. And um, I thought at the time that they were oddly reminiscent or eerily reminiscent of the World Trade Towers. And then the fact that they came down, I really wanted to be there for that moment, but it just couldn't happen. Um, so this is the border between Manitoba and North Dakota. Um, again, you know, the, the Canada-US border, whether we think about it or not, it transgresses a great number of uh, sovereign indigenous nations, including Ado Soyuz, uh, 
it unceremoniously bisects traditional steel territory. Uh, this is Garden River First Nation, so this is near what we know as uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and this bridge has become quite uh, iconographic in terms of the closure of the Canada-US border, include, including um, you know, protests as well for um, no dapple, like the Dakota Access Pipeline, and in including um, you know, a, a great number of things. It's a very kind of uh, prominent media image. Uh, this is Indian land. And when I had seen this picture originally, it was actually through Google Street View. And I remember seeing the bridge like on my previous drives across the country because I lived, lived in Montreal for a long time. My family's in Winnipeg, so I'd go back and forth and um, the highway was rerouted. There's a really interesting history with, uh, with Garden River. But when I originally saw this, this location, there was an American flag as well. And you can't see it in the JPEG, but the Canadian flag has been pasted over with an image of an indigenous person. Uh, and the American flag was too. But then when I showed up to photograph it, uh, only the Canadian flag remained. So I took what I could get. Um, this is a totally bizarre one. This is uh, the other major exclave. This is uh, uh, in, in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. It's called Angle Inlet. And it's uh, unmanned. So uh, when you drive into Angle Inlet, there are signs that say, proceed to one of the three telephone reporting booths. And they're all situated on docks because it's a popular destination for sport fishermen. And when you open up that phone on the inside of the booth, uh, you see two buttons, one that says push to call USA and the other says push to call Canada. And then there are detailed instructions in terms of how to report uh, remotely and make a declaration. Uh, some of, I mean, there was a great amount of serendipity involved in this project. Uh, I never would have imagined making this image of the improvised barricade. I still don't know who cut down the tree and who barricaded Line Road along the Richelieu River, um, but it's just, you can't make this stuff up. Like, again, you know, we're, you, we're accustomed to seeing images of the DMZ, right, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, or uh, the, you know, steel border wall between, you know, US and Mexico. Uh, and we think of these types of images when we think of the word border, but in many places along the Canada US border, it's just a fallen tree and a bunch of construction pylons. Um, there's a really sad story about this that I won't get into, but it's Taiyong's International Hotel. I mentioned earlier essentially that uh, a number of businesses were shut down along the Canada-US border as it became more and more difficult to maintain these kind of pieces of infrastructure that the border actually ran through, and this is one of them. Um, so yeah, there, there are I think 45 pictures in that series in total. And uh, that's some of them. Uh, all the images are available on my website. Um, and then I'll kind of round out with a brief project and then talk about my current research. So uh, this work, uh, I began in 2016, in 2017. Uh, I, I'm not correcting myself, it was between those two years. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, it was um, an invitation from the Canadian Forces Artist Program uh, to engage in uh, a project with the military. And uh, for a long time, I, I've been captivated by Rogers Pass. You know, I photographed in Rogers Pass for my Virtually There project. I've done a lot of hiking there. I've um, done some mountaineering there. And I, I really love the environment. It's, it's quite, uh, it's a land of dramatic juxtapositions. You have these really deep V-shaped valleys with lush temperate rainforest and then uh, rock and glaciers high up and subalpine zones. It's, it's really a diverse landscape. Uh, um, and there's a great infrastructural history there as well, which has captivated me. And uh, But for this particular body of work, I was looking at um, the Canadian Forces, uh, an operation called Operation Palachi. And it's Canada's longest domestic, longest running domestic military operation. And what they do is they use this cannon that we see here. It's a howitzer C3 105 millimeter cannon uh, to deliberately detonate or trigger avalanches in order to keep the Trans Canada Highway running smoothly. Um, so again, pictures lie. This is actually a composite of six different shots. I had to Photoshop out Parks Canada officials uh, because they they didn't sign 
uh, agreements to be in my photographs, uh, whereas the military did. Uh, so I, I went along with them for um, two different trips. Uh, one was during what they call uh, the confirmation shoot, when they calibrate the gun and make sure that everything's running well. And uh, then I went back a few weeks later um, to take photographs and to shoot high speed footage with a uh, few cameras. So this is the other video project that I'm not showing. I'll show you some stills, but the, the video is available on my website. Uh, you can watch it on Vimeo. Um, yeah, and then I was also making pictures of the avalanche debris to kind of provide some contextualization. So this, this project is currently not on display at the Canadian War Museum. Um, the show opened at the War Museum on February the 13th, I believe, something like that, uh, or 12th. And then uh, two weeks later, because of COVID-19, the museum closed. Uh, and it remains closed, but I got an email last week suggesting that the show is going to be extended until March of 2021, so that's good news. Uh, so if you happen to pass through Ottawa between now and March 2021, then stop by the Canadian War Museum and check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, yeah, so these are just some stills of the uh, troops uh, firing the cannon. So the uh, it's probably the most like climactic, most... Um, anticipatory, dramatic uh, video that I've ever worked with. Uh, the soundtrack is all based on field recordings that I did with a shotgun microphone in Rogers Pass, um, as well as like um, diegetic sounds, like sound of them actually operating the cannon. So it's really a subtle soundtrack. So if you're going to watch it, my suggestion would be use headphones or a good sound system uh, rather than your laptop speaker. Uh, but a warning, there's like one really loud bang when the cannon goes off. So you can imagine when that's going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll finish by talking about my uh, current body of work, uh, which is called After the Fire Collectively. And so when I moved out to Kelowna, originally it was for a one year period in 2016, 2017. And I was doing a sabbatical replacement for Fern Helfand um, at UBCO. And um, at that time I was like, not thinking about it too seriously. I didn't consider Kelowna to be like a future permanent home of mine or anything. Uh, but nevertheless, I felt like what kind of photographs, what kind of art can I make when I'm here? And uh, I tried a bunch of things that failed. Uh, but then uh, in the summer, early summer of 2017, that was a really uh, dramatic and, and, and uh, intense fire season. And uh, a fire broke out and I was living in the Glenmore area and my street was closed because of a fire in Okanagan Center and a number of homes were claimed in that incident. Um, and so I went to photograph the aftermath of a fire because I'd never really been around forest fires. You know, I grew up in, in Manitoba. Um, but then kind of thinking of like, I guess all my projects, like the border project, I'm not really saying like Canada's good and the US is bad with my project on oil. It's like, it's also not like good or bad. It's not a black and white project. I like to leave a good amount of space in my work for the viewer to come up, come to their own conclusions regarding uh, the landscapes that I'm depicting. And so fire uh, almost immediately presented a similar opportunity uh, because uh, the Okanagan um, is a fire adapted ecosystem. So uh, we have species of trees like ponderosa pine um, that uh, are fire tolerant, right? They can survive even moderately intense fires. Uh, I know Allison and Paul are listening to this, uh, maybe still. So uh, Allison's been doing great work regarding uh, uh, this aspect. She's been doing rubbings uh, on the trunks of trees that burned but survived. Um, uh, fire, particularly the Okanagan Mountain Fire of 2003. Um, and it's a regenerative force, right? So uh, indigenous people, the Seelk here and uh, Shishwetmik have been using fire to regenerate berry stock and drive game and to restore the landscape. And uh, all you need to do is come to the Okanagan in spring and see how green and lush and beautiful areas that have been affected by wildfire uh, become. Um, so yeah, so I started photographing I, I predominantly the aftermath of, of fire and uh, looking at it in, in a, a holistic sense. Um, what you're looking at here is a contact sheet. So uh, this is like a, 
a one-to-one -one scan of uh, my negatives. So again, each sheet of film that I use is four by five inches in size. And um, it, each shot in terms of like a monetary value, film's not cheap these days. Each shot in terms of uh, the film is about like $4.50. And then the processing is involved in that. And then I have to ship it to a professional lab. I use uh, a lab in Toronto. So uh, it ends up being about $12 a shot all, all told. So I have to be kind of, uh, uh, you know, sparing with my film. Uh, so in a day, if I shoot like eight pictures, that's a lot. Uh, normally I'll shoot like four or five pictures in a day. I, I sketch digitally and then I decide where I want to uh, shoot from. I mentioned earlier that I'd bring in an example where you can see the amount of description or detail in my shots. Uh, so here's an image uh, made one year later after that Okanagan Center fire. Uh, so this was shot in 2018. Um, I don't plan to have like the dates of when they were shot in the actual titles of the work. I just thought that I would share that since uh, some of you are here in the Okanagan. And so this is uh, privileged knowledge. Uh, so yeah, so I, I just, I, I kind of took two 100% details of these two areas and you can see uh, like the wildflowers in this case, like the brown eyed Susan. Um, so it's about the details in this work in particular, seeing those details and uh, being able to differentiate, you know, what burned with the regeneration. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate your patience and with Zoom and looking at these images on the small scale, but uh, really the best way to, to look at my work is um, full scale at an exhibition. Um, and my students, it's funny because like I'll do an artist talk and my students are like, oh yeah, your work's cool. And then sometimes I bring in large scale prints and they always come up to me and they're like, whoa, like we really like, don't take this the wrong way, but we really didn't appreciate your work until we saw the full size prints. Um, so yeah, hopefully you can see my prints sometimes somewhere if things open up. Uh, so this is the Mount Aeneas wildfire. So this was 2018. So I mentioned that I was here for 2016, 2017. And then in um, August of 2017, I moved to Calgary uh, for a year. And then I was teaching at uh, uh, the Alberta University of the Arts. It was, it was called ACAD then, the Alberta College of Art and Design. And then, and then I came back uh, in August, oh, no, July of 2018. And I've been in Kelowna ever since. Um, so yeah, so that, that summer was crazy. Last summer was really weird. It was atypical. It was wet and rainy. So I didn't make a lot of pictures last summer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, what to say about these? I mean, uh, life goes on. I guess that's the message, right? And, and life will go on after COVID and life goes on after a wildfire and people are quick to forget. So like this image made in Kettle River, uh, in the Kettle River Recreation Area. This is maybe two hours outside of Kelowna, kind of close to the Canada-US border near a community called Rock Creek. Um, you know, people keep rafting down the river and uh, I camped out there for a few nights and people were having fires, even though there was a fire ban in effect. And, uh, you know, people get on with their lives and they, like, things resume. Uh, this is Knox Mountain. This is a place that I go often. Uh, it's right in the heart of Kelowna. It's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, municipal park and um, there was a human caused fire actually. Um, I think the same person who started this fire was charged with something like 17 or 18 accounts of arson um, in 2018 including the Okanagan Center fire which uh, destroyed like I think eight or ten properties. Um, uh, this uh, this is just outside of Nelson. Uh, this is Kootenai Lake. So another thing that I've been looking into, oh, I guess I should say like uh, through the university, I'm working on uh, this research project with, um, uh, I, I'd call him a friend of mine, a uh, colleague, uh, Matthew Bourbonnet. He's in the faculty of earth geographic and environmental science. I can never get the order of those three correct in that faculty name. So I'm sorry if I messed that one up. Um, just like, just like we're the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies, but at the Alberta College of Art and Design, it was the Faculty of Critical and Creative Studies. So that was like, um, 
anyway, uh, with, with Matthew, we're, we're working on a two-year project uh, with a New Frontiers and Research Fund grant. So it's a tri-council grant um, that uh, is, is called Living with Wildfire. So uh, he and his team, are, they're investigating like LIDAR data, uh, uh, light detection and ranging. So it's like, I'm not going to explain it right now. It's too complicated, I think. But uh, they're working with LIDAR data. And I'm working with photographic data. And we're hoping to kind of bring the two together. Um, so that's a two-year project. We have, like, research assistance. But research is curtailed right now, so not a lot's happening. Um, but we're interested in the health effects as well of, of smoke, right? Uh, Matthew and I are both really uh, avid outdoor people, right? I mountain bike and climb and hike and do stuff. And smoke impacts that. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, fire retardant. So this is a landscape that's been coated in uh, chemical retardant. And what that does is it deprives the vegetation and the, the land of uh, the potential of oxygen, um, adding fuel and combustion. Uh, so, you know, this creates a barrier, essentially. Uh, it also is really freaking gorgeous in my opinion like the color is uh they call it fugitive uh the company that manufactures this stuff in canada is called foscheck i've done a bunch of research on them and um this stuff does it does fade with time but it never really completely goes away um like from the 2003 okanagan mountain park fire up at the myra trestles you can still see like rock faces that have the red retardant on them but on vegetation it, it dissipates pretty quickly uh here it is on some oregon grape and other uh local vegetation um i like to think of it as like a action painting like dilettante action painting or unintentional uh like unintentional jackson pollock um and yeah i mean i've kind of shied away from like i guess the other the other thing that this project is doing is it's presenting an alternative to the dominant media representations of wildfire so uh if you don't know what those are all you have to do is watch the josh brolin film only the brave and then you'll be like oh yeah okay like what he's doing is different um, it's, it's a very funny, entertaining film, but it's, it really depicts like this kind of heteronormative, um, firefighting, like bravado, uh, like the drug addict who's reformed. It, it just, it, it kind of plays into a lot of problematic stereotypes. Um, but yeah, usually when we're like looking at imagery in the media, um, it's, it, there's a rhetoric of threat, loss, and heroism. I guess associated with uh, with wildfire, and and I my I, I kind of endeavor at least to present an alternative to that. So I've kind of shied away from like the disaster porn images. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say am I allowed to say porn? Is that a is that a bad word? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, these kind of like images of of um, you know ru ruination, right? Um, even though they are dramatic, uh, I, I like to. I guess present some kind of element of hopefulness or um, an alternative to that. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I really want to get back down to Waterton. The Kenow fire there in 2017 uh, destroyed, well, destroyed, it burned 37% uh, of the park. And um, it's, it's unbelievably regenerative. I mean, uh, when I was there a year later the vegetation had just gone like crazy already uh the wildlife it's offering them a reprieve right because uh people aren't hiking the trails there's um like a great portion of the backcountry is closed uh so real, like popular hiking trails uh you know the bears and the the ungulates and the birds and everything they have kind of like free reign again uh, which is really positive i think um, and then my partner Leanne lived in Kamloops for a couple of years and uh, this image was made there, you know, when I was hanging out with her one day, there was a fire. Well, actually, I think I was in Kelowna at that time. I don't know. She's on the couch. Um, I, I think I was in Kelowna and she told me there was like a lightning storm and it started this brush fire and it came really close to this community um, in Kamloops. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of traveled mainly around the interior of BC and uh, the Rocky Mountain region, uh, but I hope to kind of expand the purview of this project. I think right now I'm in this holding pattern. I don't really, I have some really good leads uh, in the Similkameen and um, some, some potential for uh, really exciting photo shoots, uh, but nothing can really happen at this moment. I don't feel comfortable um, you know, driving for hours to go photograph. Um, but this is this is down again near the Canada-US border uh, between Karameus and Coston. This was the Snowy Mountain fire. Uh, and then last, um, 
last fall, this is my last image. Uh, last fall, I went down to the Eagle Bluff wildfire. So the Eagle Bluff wildfire was one of the only fires of note in the Okanagan Valley last summer uh, down near Oliver. And uh, yeah, I, I went there in, I think, October and uh, made some pictures. And I think with the spring looming, you know, uh, BC parks remain closed in a number of uh, areas of regeneration or within BC parks. I really wanted to get into the Goods Basin area of Okanagan Park, um, but that's not going to happen in the immediate future, but hopefully it will. Um, you can keep tabs on me uh, via my website, which is andreasrukowskis.com. My Instagram is how you pronounce my last name. It's rut.cows.cuss. And uh, Twitter, so I use like Instagram. I mean, it's if I had a cat, it would be mainly cat photos. Um, but my, my real research is posted on uh, Twitter. So that's the, kind of like my research repository. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, then, uh, or if you use Twitter, then you can kind of see what I'm looking at and what I'm interested in. So uh, that's me. I, I don't know if I went over time, probably a bit, but uh, thanks for paying attention. <laughs> I really appreciate your your virtual applause. <laughs> Thanks. I know I said something about like a virtual warm welcome when I was in my little intro, but I didn't say it. But we can do a virtual applause. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to thank you very much on behalf of the gallery for um, participating in this um, online version of the lecture series. We really appreciate that uh, you decided to do that with us. And um, we're just really looking forward to these opportunities to still be able to provide content to the community. So, so thank you. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, you know, I, hopefully we can get together over a drink one of these yeah, days. I recognize some of those uh, border ones from a class I took from you years ago. I think it was the first class that you actually ran when um, uh, you were first stuck here. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, how's it going? Hi, yeah. oh good. Oh. Yes, and I was just wondering, um, there's a few there though that I hadn't recognized before. So did you go back down after that time and do any more anything else um, especially around uh, Point Roberts and things or were they in them before is my memory just yeah I, I really I haven't photographed the uh, the border since May of 2015 um, I've been back to some of those areas uh, but but not to make photographs I mean a, a really interesting uh, point is the um, Roxham Road just outside of Montreal and there are a number of artists a number of photographers who have focused on that uh, point pinch point because that that really represents like one of the epicenters for uh, human migration um, but no I, I, I haven't I really continued that project I I don't know I feel like uh, there, there could be potential to work on something again but uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I said my piece about, about the border and it's just changed so much. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and again, you know, recently with uh, COVID-19 and the border being closed. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was wondering if it would, would be of any interest to you because the dynamics have changed so drastically, not um, because of COVID, of course, but also um, with uh, Trump now there too, it, you know, it, just so much attitude um, and, uh, and dynamics change. Yeah, I think, I think to kind of speak to that, um, there are a number of, you know, essentially my photography is not uh, preoccupied with the human condition, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I, I don't have a human, humanitarian vision. And there are many, uh, you know, social contemporary social documentarians that are doing a better job. I think that are better equipped to make the work that needs to be made now. And I feel like um, I made you know my statement at a at a pertinent time, and uh, I'm happy to kind of let that project exist as it exists. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> you got a question in the chat. So oh, I'm not paying attention here. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Noemi. Hi, hi. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I think the project has the potential to open up to uh, a broader <coughs> geography. Um, I, I feel like 
with any with any topic, I need to really understand the ecosystem and the environment in which I work, and um, and so necessarily like I I'm still ju I'm just in love with the Okanagan right now and and the interior of BC. Um, I'm you know I when I moved here I bought a bunch of field guides. Uh, I align myself with you know biologists and environmental scientists, and I've just still been you know, learning so much about the uh, traditions, the traditional histories, as well as the, you know, the settler histories here. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would love, it, it's, a, it's an excuse to travel and uh, the Yukon is beautiful and I've been up there and certainly the fireweed is, uh, is majestic. Um, so yeah, who knows, this summer, I mean, it, last summer there were very few fires in the Okanagan and in, in the interior of BC in general. Paradoxically, there were fires on the coast. Um, you know, even, even this year there, there was, uh, a, you know, uncontrolled fire in Squamish, a uh, pretty major uh, one at that. So I, I you know, it, with climate change, uh, it's certainly having an impact. Sometimes, um, that means you know more intense fires and sometimes that means less intense fires so i think uh, it's kind of i've become like a bit of a storm chaser with this project it's been very different than my other projects where i would be able to kind of anticipate like the mountain never moves right um generally speaking uh whereas like the fi fire is always changing and, and if you don't capture you know the ecosystem at a critical time then it, it just changes so rapidly so um, yeah, it, it's a possibility and a good suggestion. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> How long do you think you will work on this project for? Um, is there like something in your mind that you know, oh, this is done, I'm over? Or is this going to be a project that you'll probably be working on for many years? Uh, well, well, now so much depends on the, you know, easing of restrictions and the lockdown scenario, but um, the NFRF project is a two-year project, so I imagine, and my contract at UBC is uh, renewed until, I believe, September 2022, I think. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so maybe that's 2021, I don't know. Um, Anyway, yeah, so I'll, I'll keep working on it for the foreseeable future. I think um, just actually just before tuning in or showing up to present tonight, I was uh, on the Museum of Modern Arts YouTube. Okay. I was watching a conversation between the photographer Sally Mann and the curator of photography at MoMA. And uh, Sally Mann had some advice for emerging artists and, uh, and photographers in particular, and that was never work on one project at once. And I've kind of been guilty of that lately. Um, but then like, you know, looking at my presentation and thinking about her, her uh, suggestion tonight, I was like, yeah, I was working on like the Stansted project and the oil project at the same time. I was working on the border project and then I went right into the CFAP project with Rogers Pass. And then I was working on that and other things. So um, I don't know, I guess I got to come up with something else as well. Uh, but yeah, for the foreseeable future, I, I, I think it's, um, it's a, lo it's a longer term project because it's a project about change and it kind of comes back to the Vox family, uh, ethos, right? Like revisiting repeat photography, revisiting the same vantages over time. Uh, I think that's going to be an important aspect of the work. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it could be, um, easily like a 10 year project. Okay, 10 years. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, okay, uh, my partner Leanne's uh, brother Jeremy is asking uh, what happened between me and the big beaver. Um, so that that image, um, it was to, to refresh people, uh, there was like a concrete barricade with a couple of stop signs on it. And this was at Big Beaver, Saskatchewan. And at the time of my photography, um, I guess that was like summer of 2014, and that border crossing had closed uh, in 2013. So it was a, a recent closure. I think it was the most recent crossing to be closed along the border at that time. And it's in the middle of like nowhere. Um, 
if you know where Estevan, Saskatchewan is, that's the closest point. And I think Big Beaver is like two hours outside of Estevan. So uh, it's, it's quite remote. And um, I was actually, I was talking to somebody recently who lives near there and they're like, yeah, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I, I woke up in Estevan. I had spent the night in Estevan and I drove out there in the morning and you go down the secondary road, you pass a sign that says the border is closed. And then you drive like another 40 kilometers down this road from, from my recollection. I can't remember how, how long it actually was, but then you get to this crossing uh, which has been barricaded. And so I mentioned that I sketch with my digital camera. So I'd taken a few snaps with my digital camera and then I decided on uh, the vantage that I would make my picture from with the big camera. So I set up the big camera, which is a bit of a slow process. And um, the film comes in, uh, well, I put it into a film holder. So the film holder has two sides and a dark slide, which protects the film from light. So I put the film into the film holder and I put the film holder in the camera and I was like ready to take the shot and a white pickup truck came over a hill on the other side and drove up to the border and I was like oh it's border patrol and then I looked at it again and I was like this isn't border patrol and a guy got out of the van or the pickup truck and he had like a polo shirt and jeans on and he had a Nikon DSLR in his hand and he walked up to the barricade so I approached him and I said, uh, I guess this is photographers meeting across the border. And we shook hands. And uh, he looked at my camera and he said, are you like an artist or something? And I said, yeah, I'm working with a Canada Council grant. And I'm photographing the entire Canada-US border. And I said a few more things. And I said, well, what's your story? And he said, oh, um, I'm working with a Warhol Foundation grant. And I live in LA. I run an organization called the Center for Land Use Interpretation. And I was like, Matthew Coolidge? And he's like, you know of my work? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, like I follow CLUI, your, your projects are great. Um, so he, he's like a pretty reputable artist and uh, they had been doing a project, him and his organization called United Divide. And we sat there talking for like two hours and the crazy thing is nobody came to check us out in that time. There was no CCTV, there was no RCMP, no Border Patrol. I could have handed him like a bag full of weapons or cash or something and like it would have been totally fine uh and we ex we sat there exchanging stories like he was complaining about the rcmp giving him a hard time and i was complaining about the u.s border patrol giving me a hard time and then we ended up like corresponding quite a bit afterwards and they shared all their maps for uh, the pacific region because that's where i ended like this was in um maybe july or june uh, of 2014 that we met and then it wasn't until like May 2015 that I finished the project and uh, we had we had hopes of like doing something collaboratively but the way that CL, CLUI operates is they kind of turn around projects pretty quickly um, a lot of their stuff is like didactic information and iPads or, you know with um, a kind of loose photography and <laughs> he had expressed an interest initially in having some large uh, photographs in an exhibition but yeah they just kind of like moved on to the next thing and um me too so but yeah it was like weird like what are the odds if if i had like i was like ready to take the shot and leave if if it had been five minutes later we never would have crossed paths so it was pretty pretty bizarre andreas hmm Ryan Preston, your uncle here As I think I told you, some of my uh, relatives are from that Petrolia, Wyoming area, and I was very intrigued by your photography there, and it brought back some memories. I hadn't seen that area since I was a kid of about uh, 12 or 13 years old. There's a real story to be told there, and, and you told it well. Thank you very much. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, saw your, I saw your head nodding and bobbing when I was talking at that point. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. And it really is, I mean, it's the oldest continually operational oil field in the world. It's an interesting and story, isn't it? It's, it's just phenomenal. And I, I encourage anybody who's like in the, you know, if you're, if you're in Toronto, like take a couple of days and go down there. It's, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. It's a Canadian story that's not been told real well. I think you've told as best as, as has been done in the last 50 or 60 years. So Thank you for that. And it's inspired me to uh, want to go back there and revisit. 
You, you definitely should. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's also, you know, it's just a beautiful landscape. Yeah. And, um, and that's, I think that's what, you know, my, my process of photography has really taught me over the years is um, to find beauty in any place that I'm currently living, you know? And uh, when I moved to Kelowna, people were like, Oh, Kelowna, like, what are you going to do there? Um, there's no end, you know, when, when I, did this residency in Sarnia. People are like, what are you going to photograph in Sarnia? Uh, I had a friend say, Sarnia sounds like a disease, you know, which, which is arguably true. Uh, but it's, it's spectacular. You know, I think, you know, people say, well, you're from the prairies, but now you live in the mountains. Well, no wonder, you know, given what you do. And it's like, well, the light, man, if I could transport the light from a prairie sunset to any other landscape, like it's just, it's phenomenal, right? So it's about finding the beauty around you. And, um, and certainly uh, that, that time in Oil Springs, Petrolia, Sarnia, that region, um, it, it taught me really to appreciate that environment. Thank you for your comments. Thanks, Andreas. I'm reading another comment here in the chat. Uh, no, actually, um, thanks, Jeremy, for the question. The question is, uh, for your work with the Army, did you have to get your images approved prior to publishing them? Um, that was like an amazing experience working with uh, the Canadian Forces. They gave me total carte blanche. I showed up and I met with uh, the Troop Sergeant Major the first day, and he said, to be clear, uh, we've read your proposal and you're the boss. You're going to eat with us. You're going to drink with us. Our clubhouse is your clubhouse and anything that you want to do with one exception, which was visiting the munitions storage facility. Um, I had total carte blanche and they never asked a single question about the images that I was producing. Uh, there was no censorship involved. And then when that work was presented at the Canadian uh, War Museum uh, in February, uh, the reception was fantastic. I mean, I, um, I met with uh, uh, Brigadier General Mark Bilodeau, who had spent time in Rogers Pass, and he was very complimentary of the project. Everybody was very supportive. The funny thing is, uh, I've had a few negative experiences with um, Parks Canada, and they were very different about that project. They met with me on the first day and they said, you can't photograph this, you can't photograph that, you can't photograph this. And, um, and, and for that reason, I took all of their personnel out of my photographs. You know, it, I was not focusing on them, but trying to avoid them, but necessarily they made their way in. The way that it works is Parks Canada does the avalanche forecasting and then the military, they're the, the, you know, the firepower essentially, right? So they work collaboratively. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very much a tale of two organizations and I anticipated the opposite, right? You would think of Parks Canada as being more accepting, but uh, uh, no, the military were very, very open and uh, accommodating. Thanks for the question. Cool. Anybody else? <laughs> Thanks so much. This was awesome. Um, really inspiring, really beautiful work. Appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us all. And thanks everyone who joined in. It's great to see so many people engaging and listening and really appreciative. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how at least half of them are my family. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. Well, and you know what? Thank you for uh, Vernon for doing this because we have been to Vernon to to the museum and the art gallery there, and I think it's very very important at this time to be able to communicate. You know, um, the art that's out there, and it's difficult to do at this time of COVID nineteen. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. It's our pleasure. I know I'm his mother, but whatever. <laughs>
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, full transparency, my, my parents were supposed to come out here in a couple of days. And uh, so this has been a really lovely way of me connecting with, with them and as well as uh, a number of my other family members who I don't see nearly often enough. So uh, I love you guys and I miss you a lot. And um, I, I hope to see you soon. I hope that we can make that happen. Love you too. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> so yeah, so, uh, and then, yeah, uh, just uh, thanks again to the Vernon Public Art Gallery. Uh, if you guys come to Vernon, it's an amazing space. It's gonna be an even more amazing space when they get their new building. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I hope to stay in touch with, uh, with uh, the staff there in the future, so. Definitely. Great. That'd be great. Yeah. And if anyone's interested, feel free to check out our website and social media channels for all our upcoming programming. And uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Take care, everybody. Yeah. I'm going to go have some dinner. Yeah. Good <laughs> <Fair> call. <laughs>